This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co host Bob Pastorella, we chat with Masters of Horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's guest is the legendary Ronald Kelly. He is the author of books such as Fear, The Undertaker's Moon, and most recently his autobiography and writing advice book, Southern Fried and Horrified. Now this is a two-part conversation. As with all of these episodes, listen to them in any order. So by all means, listen to this one now, and then when you're done... Go back just one episode to 457. Now, in this episode, we talk about Ronald's seminal work, Fear. We talk about the rise and fall of Zebra Books. We get into some storytelling lessons Ronald has learned over the years. And a lot, lot more. Now, if you like the show, if you want to keep it alive, If you want to help me in my time of need, because I am going through a lot of things right now, I'm having a very difficult time indeed, then please do consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Thank you to our latest podcast patrons, Tom Head and Booked. Seeing a pledge from Booked got me pretty excited, so Rob Olson and Livia, so you cooking up something new? Is Rob about to launch a Patreon with Lit Reactor? What's going on, guys? Because that is very exciting. You are one of the best podcasts of all time, quite frankly, so something happening? Let us know. Well, anyway, this was meant to be... A little bit of a push for our Patreon. Started gushing over booked podcast and getting nostalgic there. So before I get carried away, let's have a little bit of an advert break. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. Their watching is The Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. Their watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. Okay, well, here it is. It is Ronald Kelly. On This Is Horror. Well, we were speaking before about Zebra Books. And so I kind of want to talk about the rise and fall of Zebra. And not only, you know, Zebra, but the horror market at that time. Like the massive boom and then, you know, the, the collapse. So... I mean, could you give us a little bit of a history lesson on that? 
Well, you know, I started writing for Zebra in 1990, so I kind of come in on, on the tail end of, of the Zebra thing. I, I, I kind of missed the skeleton covers by two years, you know. That mm-hmm. was one thing. When I found out that I was going to write for Zebra, I, I went out to the local drugstore and and looked at the zebra books and said, hmm, no zebra, no uh, skeletons. So <laughs> that was one thing that was encouraging about it. But, uh, <laughs> um, but then I started writing for them and, and it was, you know, it was an isolated process. I mean, you, you would uh, write the novel and you'd, you'd send in a detailed outline and zebra would uh, accept it or, you know, usually. And, and then you write the book and submit it to your agent, and they, you know, get it to Zebra, and then Zebra put it in the motion, and you just go back to writing a new book, and and so it was, you know, you know, it it was wasn't like it was today with you know you got social media and you're interacting with a lot of people. It was more of a you know isolated uh, process, and uh, if you talk to fellow authors or or readers, it was, you know, on the phone or through snail mail because, you know, we basically didn't have the internet back then. And so I was kind of kept in the dark that things were getting kind of, you know, iffy with the horror genre. I thought everything was going fine. Uh, maybe I saw some signs and I, I just kind of ignored them, you know. And by the time that fear came around, see, I, the, when I uh, wrote in 1990, I had two books. Um, I had Hindsight and Pitfall came out in the same year. And then in 1991, um, I had two books come out, Zebra books. And then it went to one book a year. And then by the time Fear came out in 1994, I skipped a year. And that kind of threw me off because I, you know, I had been steadily, you know, releasing a book every year, you know, or maybe two. And then in 1995, I didn't have any book come out. And that kind of concerned me, you know, and I didn't know. I wasn't privy to a lot of the information that the uh, the agents and, and, and some of the bigger writers had, you know, that maybe horror was in trouble, you know. And um, one of the reasons I think, uh, the implosion happened was that a lot of, I mean, there was uh, such a hunger for horror during those uh, those early 1990s that uh, the the horror mass market horror publishers were trying to feed the frenzy and and uh, they were hiring writers who really wasn't up to you know. Um, to write in really good horror. They, there was a lot of bad horror uh, um, published that, you know, wasn't, you know, up to par and, and uh, um, readers were buying these books and getting burnt. And then, and they, they started, you know, not buying horror like they were, the sales started falling off and, and um, a lot of the publishers were gravitating toward, calling horror books thrillers and suspense books, you know, you know, because horror be- kind of became a, a bad word, you know. And, and um, so um, the publishers, are they, they were starting to suffer, you know. Sales were down on horror novels and everything like that. And uh, um, they started to uh, breaking ties with their authors and, and shutting down their horror lines and, I started seeing this and I thought, well, you know, Zeeper's a pretty, you know, strong uh, publisher. I don't think, you know, I have anything to worry about. And, and, um, and I had a, I used to do signings at a used bookstore in Nashville and uh, the lady that owned it, she would, you know, she would come up and say, are you okay? Is, have you heard anything from your publisher? You know, I, I heard that so-and-so got to, uh, got cut from their, their horror line and, and, you know, this publisher had, had stopped, you know, publishing it completely. And I, I told her, no, I'm okay. You know, which I wasn't because, uh, um, I sold, um, 
I saw Blood Kin, and it was going to come out in 1996. And I had two other novels I had written I, 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 that I completed a, a two book deal. Uh, uh, Zebra had the Hell Hollow and Restless Shadows, and then um, I was waiting for another multi book deal, and Zebra wouldn't give me one. They were kind of uh, uh, give me the cold shoulder. You know, I was submitted uh, outlines for books, and they said, "Well, we that's not what we want at the time." And that wasn't that wasn't like Zebra. That was pretty much what you know. I pitched to them. They you know wanted to publish, so I knew something was up. And then uh, I was waiting for the multi book deal. Things were getting kind of tight with money and all that, and. Uh, in October of 1996, it was October 6th, I, I remember it, you know, very vividly. Uh, I got a call from my agent, and, and I thought, well, here we go, you know, another multi-book deal. And he said, uh, he said, I've got news, but it's not good news. And so he told me that Zebra had shut down their horror line, and and I, I'd no longer be writing for Zebra. And, and that was my job at the time. I mean, I was... That was my full time job writing uh, mass market paperbacks, and it just uh, it hit me like a gut punch, you know. And uh, it was my own nine eleven, uh, you know. Uh, just lost my horror career in, in a matter of a phone call, and so uh, and it happened to a lot of people, you know. Uh, a lot of uh, really good writers, you know, lost their careers during that time. Uh, some stuck it out and and, and uh, struggled and, and and kept on when you know horror picked back up, you know, in the early two thousands, you know. And but uh, you know, like I said before, I I just uh, you know I tried different genres. I couldn't get in. And so I got discouraged and, and just gave it up for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you spoke before about being encouraged to pick it back up from the likes of Brian Keane and James Newman and Brian Smith. But I know something that we haven't touched on that you've mentioned before that is during that period, there was a reluctance whether to go back to horror fiction because of your religious convictions and being a Christian. So, I mean, can we talk a little about that? Yeah, you know, when, I, when you're a Christian, you believe that God has his hand in all things. And when I lost my horror writing career, I, I thought that maybe that was, you know, divine intervention on my um you know that maybe i shouldn't be writing horror you know maybe that's why i lost it so i got heavily back in into my you know faith and uh and just uh you know that's one reason i just turned my back on horror i didn't i didn't write horror and i didn't read any horror for 10 years and uh and, but you know it it wasn't satisfying. It, it didn't. It didn't make me happy because you know I'm I'm a horror writer and I, and I love to read horror and and so you know the whole time the whole decade that I didn't write or read horror. I mean it was still in the back of my mind. You know it 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 was uh, it was a difficult time. You know and and like I said I would write little ideas on slips of paper and and. Uh, so I was still, I mean, the ideas were still coming and everything, but uh, I was trying to deny that, you know, that desire to write, you know, to myself, because I, I basically talked myself into thinking that uh, that God didn't want me to write this stuff anymore. Um, you know, I've, I've, you know, in a way, I've always had, you know, a kind of a, I wouldn't say it's guilt about writing horror. It's it's like this hesitation, you know, because you know, you know, people of faith really, you know, they they it's it's pretty much thought that you know you shouldn't be writing this stuff, you know. But uh, you know, I always look at it like you know, 
you know, I'm, my my favorite horror novels and stories is you know the the battle between good and evil. So I don't think that my inspiration for writing horror has anything to do with the devil or or evil or anything like that. I I, I think I've been blessed with you know the talent to to storytell you know and write write and, and do and storytell like my grandmother did. Um, and I don't think it, it's come from, you know, anything bad. So, um, yeah, you know, that was one thing that made me hesitant about coming back was, you know, I, I got heavily into church again and everything. And, but, uh, but, you know, when I realized I wasn't happy not writing, uh, and I, I found out that people were asking about me and they wanted me to come back, you know, that was the catalyst to, you know, that I, to make me think that, you know, maybe I'd been mistaken with, you know, what I'd talk myself into, you know, that maybe, you know, I would be happy and, and more fulfilled if I came back and wrote and, and I was right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and with those, I mean, the dilemmas and that initial hesitation, do you have any hard lines in terms of things that you will not write about or is any topic a potential topic to mine for a story but it just depends on you know the way in which it's done well i i don't like to really write anything that's religiously blasphemous um i don't use the f word but that's just something that's my personal choice you know um I don't condemn anybody who uses, you know, that sort of language or anything, but it's just a personal choice that, you know, I don't use the F word. And um, as far as, I mean, I, I, I do write extreme horror, um, splatterpunk stuff. I mean, I do cross some lines sometimes that, that maybe, you know, I kind of sort of have to disconnect myself from, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't say disconnect myself from my faith, but from that mindset, you know, when I write like extreme horror, like uh, the stories that were in um, um, the Essential Six stuff and uh, After the Burn, it has some really brutal uh, stuff in it. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's not a whole lot that I'm going to draw a line at, but there, there's a few things that I just kind of uh, told myself, you know, I would never do. I'm not saying that I, I'll never, you know, do it because, you know, I've got a long, I think I've got a, a ways to go before I stop writing, you know, permanently. But, uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, you know, I'm, if you if you read the essential six stuff, you said you can say that I don't pull my punches very very much in that book. So, um, you know that's you know there's that's 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 about all all there is you know to to what I draw a line with. Yeah, and if people want to compare the two different aesthetics or modes in terms of your short stories, then two pieces to look at are of course essential six stuff as you mentioned and then kind of compare that with the halloween store right that, yeah. i i mean actually both of them in terms of the titles they are as advertised you know exactly <laughs> what you're going to get you know right. just from that title i mean with the halloween store i feel like okay i'm gonna settle down by the fire and i'm gonna hear like a, a good old horror yarn in the best kind of way in a very nostalgic way there's gonna be monsters there's gonna be creepy stuff there's gonna be little lessons and it mm -hmm. it does almost reading that one in particular really transport me back to to childhood and a time of innocence and when there was just infinite possibilities in terms of monsters and ghosts. It's, you know, very exciting. Kind of gives me a warm feeling. Well, good. good. You know, I, that's what I, when I, when I 
put together these little collections like uh, Mr. Glowbones and the Halloween store and Seasons Creepings. It's, it's, you know, that's what I'm shooting for. I'm shooting for, you know, uh, you know, the fun we had as children and, and the nostalgic feel and stuff like that. Now there's, uh, you know, there's stories in some of these like, uh, uh, pretty little lanterns and, um, the Halloween store is pretty brutal and <laughs> bloody, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, for the most part, they're, you know, they're fun stories and, and kind of give you a, um, a nostalgic feel that, you know, from, you know, things you've experienced before yourself. Yeah. And of course, I mean, the, the essential, the essential six stuff it is available now from Crossroad Press. Right. So, mm-hmm. I I mean, I guess there was a small period of time where it was out of print after the collapse of Silver Shamrock, but right. thankfully, it was picked up again very quickly. Yeah, that was that was kind of a you know I've I've been through seven seven shutdown publisher shutdowns before, so that yeah, you know, that was a that was a tough thing to get through because i had three major books with silver shamrock and, mm-hmm. and but you know the horror community was at a point there where you know you know there was a lot of horror publishers that you know really opened their arms and and invited the the silver shamrock uh authors to you know saying you know you know let me see your stuff you know we'd love to have you and so it wasn't as bad as it could have been because you know the community it, it, right now is is so uh, welcoming and, and inclusive that uh, you know that uh, it it wasn't the major disaster that it could have been. Yeah, and I mean, unfortunately, you know the, these shutdowns do seem to be part of the business. So I mean, people listening, if if they're in this. For the long term, then there's a reasonable possibility that it is something that at some point in their career they will experience. So, I mean, given that you've been through seven of these, what are the kind of things that people can practically do when this happens? I mean, both from a career perspective, but also in terms of taking care of themselves mentally because i mean it must be a traumatic and an unpleasant experience it is i mean it is i mean over over time if you experience it enough you you learn to adapt to you know that happening you know pretty quickly but uh uh, my advice would be to you know uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket don't you know specifically um submit your work to one publisher, you know, and, um, right now I'm working with several public, I mean, work, I'm working with, uh, Thunderstorm and Crossroads and Death's Head and Stygian Sky and DNT. So I've got several publishers that, uh, publish different books of mine. And, and, uh, um, that, that kind of gives you, um, you know, if, if one publisher goes down, then you're not, you know, you're not hurting so bad. Um, so, you know, if, you, if, if you're a pl- prolific writer and, and you, you're putting out, you know, books, a lot of books and everything, yeah, you know, find different publishers and, and that, that, uh, will present your work well and everything. And, and that way, you know, if one shuts down, then, you know, you've got several others that you can turn to usually. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, given that you're working with a number of different publishers and given all your experience in the industry, there must be things that you are and aren't looking for when you're looking for a new publisher. So, I mean, what are some of those things? What are some of the red flags and what are some of the deal breakers for you? Well, just, I mean... It, it is it's always you know if you're if you're submitting to a new uh publisher you know uh, indie publisher um i usually wait and see what their track record is with 
books, if they put out too many or they announce too many writers at one time, that's almost a red flag because uh, it, I mean, it's really easy for a publisher to, to, to get really enthusiastic and, and just bite off more than they can chew. You know? So uh, you might watch that. Um, um, of course, I, I, I work with publishers that, I mean, they're putting out a lot of good quality books, so that doesn't always apply. But, uh, you know, don't, if you're going to write, you know, make sure you get a good percentage of royalties. Um, uh, a crossroads, I, I've worked with Crossroads for like 12 years, and they have one of the best royalty cuts that uh, that I know of and, and, uh, and pay on uh, monthly so i mean that that's a that's a good i always look at crossroads as a as a good example of a indie publisher so um but yeah you know just um you know be aware of um what they have to offer um and and how they present you know their their uh, books and and you know kind of you know check them out on social media see how they they conduct their their sales on social media because uh, uh, that can be a big uh, a big turning point you know we we've seen where where publishers have uh, hadn't always been uh, as discreet as they could be you know um, on social media I know you know everybody has a has a, a right to voice their opinion and everything, but you you know if you're if you're got a publishing house and you've got dozens of writers, uh, you know, depending on you, you know, to put out their books and and stuff like that, uh, you need to be really careful about uh, you know raising the ire of, uh, of you know the horror community and all that. You know, we've seen ser- it happen several times, uh, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, that, that that's a few things you might look, you know, for when you when you're looking for a, a, a indie publisher, and uh, it, the same thing goes for you know um, some of the the big pub, New York publishers too. It's 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 harder to see, you know, because uh, a lot of the New York publishers, it's um, uh, it's all um, you know staff driven and and um uh decisions made by boardroom and and stuff like that so it's hard it's hard to see the back um the back information with with a a big name publisher like that but uh, if you're gonna concentrate on a lot of the indie presses you know there's things you can look for yeah yeah and i guess it's good to have a benchmark as it were like crossroad and I mean, am am I right in thinking that, I mean, you said that you've been with them for 12 years, but your friendship with with David Niall Wilson, that would precede that relationship? Am I right there? Yeah, I I, I knew David a little bit before we, you know, I mean, he wrote in the the Small Press magazines, back when I did, you know, yeah. you know, we kind of lost touch after a while, but he contacted me when I came back and, and he really helped me, you know, get started, you know, get my, my work back out there for people to, to read, especially when the eBooks became so popular. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, have, having someone who's, who not only you've known for so long, but, you know, has almost been there in the trenches with you <laughs> must right. be quite mm-hmm. reassuring too. It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got a few questions on Patreon and I know that this has been touched on a little bit, but let's go for this one from Tracy Kenworth. I wondered, coming from a southern fried background, what kind of legends or horror stories did you hear about growing up and how did they influence your writing? Well, like I said, my grandmother told me a lot of stories and, and, you know, I've always grown up with like the bill, Witch because, 
Adams, Tennessee is just, you know, not very far from where I live and everything. And, and that's the Bell Witch was always something that I, from the time I was a child, you know, and uh, I think I touched in Southern Fried and Horrified that uh, uh, my my father would tell me stories of bloody bones and and that would be the Bell Witch. And, and you know, I, I almost imagined that they were living in the basement of our house in Nashville, <laughs> plotting to pull me down into the basement and everything. So, uh, you know, I, I grew up with some old ghost stories and, and uh, you know, legends like that, you know, here in Tennessee. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I always love to, to read uh, mainly Wade Wellman and his Silver mm-hmm. John stories. Uh and uh, Ambrose Beers wrote a lot of uh, rural kind of Civil War stories. I love, always loved to read him. And uh, of course, when I, you know, started writing in the nineties, Joe Lansdale was always, you know, I, I love Joe's work. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, you know, I always um, the South has a, um, you know, there's always been a, a storytelling. Um, ghost story thread to, uh, you know, upbringing in the South. So, you know, I, I had that upbringing, you know, where, you know, I heard ghost stories just about all my life. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, um, when you're in the South, you, you grow up hearing, you know, stuff like that and, and, and not necessarily believing it, but, you know, it, it's always fun to hear those old ghost stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in terms of your personal experience, have you had something that you would describe as either seeing a ghost or having what might be a supernatural experience or something disquieting? I did have one. Uh, when I was a younger man, I guess I was in my 20s, I, I loved to go to the Civil War battlefields and I I went to Stones River Battlefield in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I was walking down a trail by myself. I would go by myself, you know, and I I walked down this lonesome trail in, in the backwoods, and I got this eerie feeling that I wasn't alone. It was like, it, it was strange to describe, but it was like, I felt like there was a massive uh, presence around me, almost like hundreds of men on each side of me going down this trail, like almost like um, you know troops, you know walking through the woods, you know. And it got very, you know, very strong, very uh, ominous, you know. And and it started frightening me because you know I, I got this feeling it was almost like this feeling overcame me you know of, of fear like anticipation like almost like men going into battle and and i reached this sharp turn in the the trail and i stopped and i thought if i go around that bend i'm going to say something that i don't want to see you know and and at that moment that feeling just dissipated it just went away so you know that that's the only time I've ever had a a uh, an experience where I felt like maybe there was an otherworldly presence. Maybe I, sometimes I believe that what people interpret as ghosts are like lingering um, uh, emotional energy mm-hmm. in, a, in a certain place. You know, like certain houses give off this an aura of of a of a, a tragedy or a happening that that happened in the past and you might interpret that as being haunted but it's it's it may merely be some uh, some uh, emotional energy left over from a certain incident or something like that mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's a good job you didn't go round that bend. <laughs> <laughs> no telling what I was saying. Yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> well, Patrick McDonough would like to know, what is a topic or two that you wish more interviewers asked you about? You know, I don't know. I, 
A lot of the interviewers want to know more about the writing process than, you know, how I got to the to the end result. You know, uh, I, I like to talk about, you know, where, I, you know, if you read the book, you'll see that, I you know, I, I like to talk about my upbringing and, and how I, you know, inv- evolved into the type of person who writes horror and all that. So that's, that's one thing. And, um, a lot of people don't ask me about my faith and how it affects my horror writing. And and so that's, that's something else. Um, so yeah, there, there's a few things that people don't touch on, you know, very often. I normally don't talk about my family, you know, my present family life, but, uh, um, you know, um, um, you know, like I said, I'm retiring in November, so I'm I'm looking forward to to just kind of taking it easy, and and you know, I've got all this stuff in my head that I want to write in the coming years, so that's that's a good thing. Yeah. Do you think when you retire, you'll kind of lay your day out so that you're like? doing a lot more writing in a kind of structured manner? I mean, what, what do you think, what, what does a typical day look like for you now? And what do you envisage it might look like once you're retired? Well, I don't get much writing done. You know, I, I, I work, I get up at three thirty in the morning, go to work. I get off at one thirty in the afternoon, which that's a good thing. Um, uh, sometimes I get a little writing done, you know, after work and, uh, but I, I mostly write on the weekends. I, you know, I stay up till, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning and write. And, but it's, 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 it's difficult when you, you know, when you want to, you know, write, um, you're really fired up about a, a certain story or a novel or something you want to write and you have very limited time to do it. And I know we all go through that, you know, um, especially everybody who, who works for a living and everything, and, and, you know, taking care of your family and all that. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, when I retire, I'm going to try to, you know, structure it, you know, like I did, pretty much like I did when I wrote for Zebra, you know, mm. um, get up and, and have breakfast and then sit and write for a certain amount. And, you know, I'll, I'll probably uh, allocate time to, you know, for social media and, and uh, and doing, you know, a lot of people buy books from me directly. So, you know, I spend some time uh, signing books and and, uh, and shipping them. And uh, one thing about when when somebody buys a book directly from me, I, I always draw on the title page. You know, I I, I do like a, a detailed uh, illustration. You know, that's kind of something that's become a trademark with me and uh yeah it's kind of difficult when you go to conventions because you you know because of time restraint you know but Mm -hmm. i always um you know everybody seems to be appreciative of the effort you know i put into illustrate you know putting a a hand-drawn uh illustration on the title page whenever you know anybody buys a book from me but uh, that's that's another thing that takes up a lot of my time is is the book selling and stuff like that but uh yeah, I'll be able to, you know, you know, I, I've mostly concentrated on short story writing and everything for the past few years, and this will, this will give me a uh, opportunity to to get into some full length novels again. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm sure people hearing that if they buy directly from you, they will get you know some, some art, a little drawing. So that begs the question: Where do people go? to get these books directly from you. Usually they just, you can contact me through, you know, messenger or, or, uh, through Twitter or, or Instagram. That's usually the way it is now, but I am, I am gonna, uh, in November after I retire, I am going to put together, a an online store. So, so it make it a little easier for everybody to order from me and everything. I, I'll, I'll kind of miss the, the one-on-one, uh, one-on-one, um, contact I have with people because you know usually when they you know, contact me uh, we'll get in a conversation or something about stuff and, and uh, you know 
but you know, if it, you know, anybody wants to contact me, you know, through messenger or Twitter or Instagram, you know, uh, shoot me a private message and I'll be glad to, to, uh, fix you up with some Southern fried horror. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, of course, We've been speaking about Southern Fried Horror, and this is a term that you coined. Mm. So it might be a little bit late in the conversation to ask this, but what is Southern Fried Horror? What, how do you define that? You know, what separates Southern Horror from Southern Fried Horror? Well, it's actually my... my... Uh, webmaster when I put together my website when I came back uh, Hunter Goatley he 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 runs uh, Robert McCammon's website he put one together for me and he came when he showed me the first page of when it said Southern Fried Horror you know he coined that phrase and I said that sounds good to me you know and so we we went with that that's what I've been calling it from then on I think Southern Fried Horror is is sort of like you know when you think of southern fried you think of comfort food like yeah uh you know gravy and biscuits and and bacon and uh, uh and stuff like you know those southern um standard you know that mama used to make you know and all that and so you know the way i write it's you know it's laid back it's uh well you know unless you get into the to the extreme stuff, but usually my, my stuff is, you know, laid back, nostalgic, and it has a little fun, a little humor to it. And so I, I guess that's, that's how you would, uh, uh, determine this Southern, is Southern fried. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it certainly, you know, sounds delicious. It's like, yeah, <laughs> my, I want some of that. <laughs> oh Yeah. It's all, it's all the food that makes you become a diabetic. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> I, I'm in the South and I'm a diabetic and I do love my Southern fried chicken fried steak. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one book that I guess was pivotal in terms of your career and a book that you've said was one of the easiest to write in that it just really came out of you was fear. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to date, is that still the easiest story that you've written? It, yeah, it really was because I can't tell you where fear came from. I woke up one morning and it was in my head and uh, I was, you know, I was right for Zebra. I actually wanted to do a a, a, a ghost story and I was like a couple of chapters into it. And then I woke up one morning with the story for fear in my head. And so I just sat down and wrote it and it just, it, it flowed naturally, you know? And, um, I think a lot of it came from my childhood, you know, like, yeah, you know, er, whenever anybody asks me, is there a character that, you know, um, is the most like me, I think Jeb Sweeney and, and fear, was mm. how I was as a child. I wasn't necessarily a, a farm boy, but, uh, you know, I did live in a, a small rural town and, and, uh, we'd, we'd go out in the woods, you know, and tramp through the woods all day and, and, uh, ride our bikes, you know, across county and back, you know, and that's, that's the way things were back then. You know, kids had seemed to have more freedom back then. So I got this idea to write this book set in the 1940s, and and um, I just I I can't tell you where it came from, but uh, it, it turned out to be uh, my most popular novel, and and uh, probably the most profitable one uh, with Zebra because uh, uh, even after the Zebra line shut down um, a few a few years later, uh, they they reprinted the uh, fear under the, uh, the pinnacle label. So fears, fears had several different, um, um, incarnations, you know, and, uh, and it's just, if it's the book that everybody, uh, gravitates to 
you know, whenever anybody asks, you know, which book should I read first, I always, you know, refer that book to them because I think that kind of sums up my style of writing and kind of my personality as far as uh, being a Southern writer is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we spoke about food and there is literally one passage where you list off so much food <laughs> like it mm -hmm. must be like half a page or something it's like you you are not messing about you are really going for it here. well if, if you've ever been to a southern picnic you know a yeah. church a church <laughs> dinner or something you know i wasn't too far away from the truth with that <laughs> yeah because they have every, i mean you can sample you know, dozens upon dozens of dishes at, at some southern event. You know, so mm -hmm. that just that was fun. You know, kind of that was a fun little passage to write because I, I I was thinking of everything I'd ever ate at a <laughs> at a church picnic or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it reminds me of the rice festival where they cook every type of Cajun food that you can think of that has rice, which is mm -hmm. pretty much all of them. But you know. And you pay like, you know, basically five, ten dollars to get in and you just go around and you eat and it's just and it's usually samples. That's all you need to do is and you yeah. can hit like five or six places. And you're like, shoot, I'm done. I need a nap. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, that, that kind of I don't know. It's just southern food. I mean, if you're not if you're not familiar with it, it it's I love getting people from out of town to, to mm -hmm. try, you know, Southern food and the look on their faces when they see that it's just, it's so good. They're like, that don't even look good. And they taste it like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of it has to do with grease and stuff like right. that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, don't ask how it's made. Just, just eat it. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. A lot of bacon grease has gone into Southern dishes. So. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing that makes fear like, you know, cause a lot of people kind of compare it to, you know, boy's life and, mm -hmm. and things like that. It stands on its own. There's a lot of heart in that book. There's a lot of, you, you, you get us to where we, we actually give a damn about these characters and we, we feel them and it's characterization on, on a level when go, going back and read it, comparing to stuff today it seems like that you, you, you had, you had a very leisurely time to, to, to do that. And you kept it interesting the whole way. Mm. So there's nothing that, that makes it ever, you know, go into it like, a, Oh, well, I really would hope he would hurry up and get over with this and get back to the story. That is the story. That's the, the to me reading that stuff. It's just, it's not nostalgic. It's the writing so clean and crisp, just really, really excellent writing there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it's just, it, it was a rare occurrence where um, a book almost wrote itself. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, you know, I don't know how much credit I can take for it because it just came naturally. And, you know, I love those characters. I am going to write a sequel to fear. Oh, wow. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's my, that's my big project. When I, after I retire, I'm going to sit down and write the sequel. I actually have the, Last chapter written, the last chapter's in stone. It's going to make you cry. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm getting my credit card out now. Here we go. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I kind of debated whether I was going to write a sequel to Fear, and but I, I came up with a good idea, and I think, uh, I think everybody's going to, I'm going to like it. So, um, yeah, that's going to happen for sure. Have you spoken about the sequel to Fear anywhere else? Uh, I've kind of mentioned it, you know, vaguely, you know, time or two. Yeah, you know, lately, I, you know, the closer I get to to actually writing it, I, I kind of open up about it a little bit more. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody, you know, knows now knows that I'm gonna, you know, tackle it when I. When I have more time, I, I want to have plenty of time to just, um, you know, and I think it's going to be a big book. I can't see writing a sequel to Fear and it not being almost equal to in length to the original Fear. You know? uh, right. The original Fear, 
when they get over into uh, Fair County, it's like almost like little short stories. It's like each chapter is a different adventure, you know. And so I'm going to, that's going to be kind of a challenge to when they go, you know, if, when they go back into Fair County, it's going to be, and it's going to, there's actually going to be some cosmic horror injected into this storyline because I have, uh, I've been writing the, the saga of Dead, Dead Eye, my, my Western horror series, and uh, more and more, you know, like cosmic horror and other dimensions and stuff are kind of creeping into the storylines and, and, I can see that happening with with uh, with the sequel to Fear, where it kind of gives you an idea of why the county's so evil. Because you know, things the the monsters and the evil people might be coming from a different source than you know the sources that we know here on, on Earth. So uh, I'm I'm kind of excited to write it because you know there's a lot of possibilities that I can open up, you know, and uh, and make it. Uh, and make it its own story and not just, you know, a rehash of fear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there anything you can tell us about you know, the, the time period that the sequel will be set in or it'll still- be, it'll be set in today's time period. Um, I'm not going to go into, it's, it's going to be a strange book because, it may have the same, some of the same characters that was in the other book, which was set in the forties, but uh, I just won't go into it any further because I want everybody to see yeah. how, I, how I pulled that off. I didn't know how I was going to pull it off until, uh, you know, just recently, just the, the past uh, six months, I, 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 it came to me and I thought, you know, if this had come to me, 10 years earlier, I'd probably have written it then, but mm. I get, you know, all stories and all books have their, their time. You know, I think, uh, uh, sometimes you get a, a germ of an idea for a, a story or a book and it doesn't come about for, for years and years. Uh, the dead eye, my Western horror, uh, series, I had that idea when I was in junior high and, and, and pitched it several times to to uh, publishers, you know, between then and and now, and and finally, uh, I I kind of mentioned it to Paul Goblish, and he wanted to do you know do like a limited series, like of five books. So we we decided to do that. So see, uh, you could have you could have uh, story ideas for years and years, and. But it, you know, I think it, it it just has to come at the right time. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any sense as to when we might get to read the sequel to Fear? I mean, obviously everyone's now like thrusting their credit cards at the computer <laughs> in the hope that the book will just manifest in front of them. But I'm I'm not sure that that's how it works. <laughs> well, you know, I'm. Um, Crossroads will be putting it out, mm-hmm. uh, and probably Thunderstorm will be doing the limited. So if I start writing on it in November and I get it done by maybe March, mm-hmm. I'd say we'll have it next summer. Uh, next summer, summer twenty twenty three. So um, uh, probably not in time for ArthurCon, but uh, um, who knows? I mean, you know. I work with Crossroads Press. They're very fast. I mean, um, usually when I want to put out a little collection or something, we can have it out in two months after I put it together. And so I, I would say, you know, if I get it done early, there's a very real possibility that I might have it at AuthorCon, but uh, I'm not going to promise that <laughs> in stone. So um, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um it depends on the middle of the book. I, I've got the first part of the book kind of laid out um, solid, but it's it's when they get into Fear County and they're encountering the different horrors and everything. That's that's when I'm going to have to really brainstorm, and and uh, I'm hoping that it comes as easily as the first book did. Yeah, yeah. 
And there's something special about it coming out on almost the 30th anniversary of the original right, book, too. Right, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, as, as you said, fear just kind of came to you, then, I mean, I would assume there was little in the way of planning. You know, it, it was what you know, some people term more as pantsing. Yeah. It was, it, yeah, because I, I, I never, you know, Zebra did require you to do a outline, to submit an outline, you know, and I just kind of shift gears, you know, they, they were expecting that ghost story, and I kind of shifted gears, so I had to um, think up most of the book, you know, and it, and really, when I got to the end of fear, it wasn't a whole lot the way it was the the outline that I submitted to my agent to Zebra, but uh, but they were very pleased with it, and uh, and so was I. But um, it, yeah, it's funny because I'll, there's I've written some books where you start out thinking the the book's going to go a certain way, and it takes a a, a sharp turn. Yeah, you know, it the same. That's the way it was with Twelve Gauge. Uh, it started out as, you know, like a serial killer, dark crime book, and it just got really brutal and bloody. You know, <laughs> it, mm -hmm. took a, it took a, a complete left turn. And, and But, I mean, it's, yeah, a lot of people love, you know, 12 Gauge. And uh, so, um, you know, you can't always say a, a book's you know set in stone when you when you first come up with it because it you know circumstances you know that sometimes your characters you you'll start writing a character and then your character will evolve during the writing process and and it'll shift the whole um the whole plot of the story or the dynamic of it and and um and that's a that's a, just a weird thing that happens sometimes um uh, sometimes you have a minor character and they, they end up becoming a major character. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's so many times where I've heard about authors who were required to send an outline to the publisher. And so of course they did because they're obligated to, but then mm -hmm. the actual book that they, <laughs> you know, submit bears very little, if any yeah. resemblance to the outline, it's like, well, you got an outline you also got a book. It's just <laughs> that they're not really the same thing here, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, you know, a lot of the, the the mass market publishing when I started out was almost the books were uh, formula. You know, they that was written by a formula. You know, so it's the way the Hallmark movies are now, where you know the the person you know gets fired from their job and they go to a small town, they, they meet a, a new love and then their boyfriend or girlfriend come, you know, shows up in the middle of the movie and, and you know, it, it, you know, my wife doesn't like me to talk about it. She, she thinks I'm thinking, making fun of her movies when, <laughs> when I point out that the formula that they use and everything. But, uh, that's, that's, that's why Zeeper kind of wanted, they wanted, the uh, you know the books laid out a certain way, and I mean it's not like it is today, where uh, you know, like uh, a lot of the books, like um, like uh, Paul Tremblay's uh, uh, new one, the Paul Bears Club. Oh yes. you know, the, the yeah, the way it's laid out, you know, it's 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 incredible, and you know, like House of Leaves, you know, House of mm, Leaves. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, I think you know writers have a, have more freedom nowadays to to you know do you know take chances and do stuff like that where you didn't you know years and years ago you know um so yeah i know uh, eric laroca La you know but he mm. he uh wrote you know that wonderful novella he wrote i mean it there was a lot of you know like emails and and stuff the way it was written and everything and that's just a, you know it's just a different way of, of telling the story you know uh I mean, it's it's not. I don't think it's gimmicky or anything like that. It's just it's a unique way to convey uh, a story where you know it, it it really keeps the 
uh, the reader's interest in, in, you know, like that. No, I mean, Dracula was basically letters and newspaper clippings. Right, yeah. You know, you know and anytime people suck about, you know, anything that's out of the ordinary, it's like, oh, I don't want to read that. It's a bunch of emails. I'm like, did, did, do you like Dracula? I mean, because it's right. pretty much like written today, it'd be a bunch of emails. <laughs> you know, so I mean, <laughs> Weird, but yeah. Or, tw- or Twitter, uh, a bunch of Twitter posts or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then that's in public domain. If someone rewrote Dracula and did it as Twitter post. Yeah. That it was public. Oh, that'd be fucking wild. <laughs> it, would <be. laughs> it would be insane. <laughs> yeah, well, there's probably someone listening to this who's like, you know what? I'm going to do know. it. Why not? <laughs> no, why not? Yeah. That would be cool. I'd probably read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, as long as that person who's going to do it isn't me, because there is part of me that's like, could be done. It's like, no, you've, you've got enough bloody projects on the go at the moment. Don't, <laughs> oh, wow. don't right. start rewriting <laughs> Dracula. I think, out of the, the three, I think that out of the three of us in this conversation, at least three of us are thinking this could actually work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it yeah. crossed my mind when you mentioned it. Yeah, we're we're all gonna now start it immediately. We've all got our different oh, no. versions, <laughs> like competing. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, before you go, tell us a little bit about the cellar door on Elkins Avenue. Oh yeah. Uh, well, my. Uh, It was a little house, um, old house, and uh, my bedroom uh, um, was right next to a black door, and that that was like almost like the gate to hell to me (laughs) when I was a little boy because, uh, you know, uh, as far as I know, my my father never went down into the cellar, and, and whenever he did, I mean, it was just like a a black tunnel going down. I mean, there was one light bulb or maybe a 40 watt light bulb. And, uh, so, I mean, I think, I think there was like a, a, a boiler or a furnace or something down there. But, you know, when, uh, my parents would tell me, you know, the, 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 te- uh, stories of the, the man with the golden arm and, and the bell witch and bloody bones and, and, I'd go to sleep at night and I'd hear like maybe a mouse or something scratching on the, in the wall or something like that. I'd think, you know, here comes the bell witch and bloody bones and the guy who lost his golden arm. He's coming up the stairs to drag me down in there. You know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, you know, that was, you know, that was my imagination, you know, going full force, you know, at five or six years old. So, um, and uh, I think I, you know, uh, in the book, I kind of, you know, when we moved from the city and we moved out in the country, I always wondered, you know, were they still down in the basement, you know, you know, kind of, you know, wondering where I was and and uh, maybe they was down there playing cards or something, you know, <laughs> lonesome because they didn't have me to kidnap and, and drag down to the basement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it feels like every kind of aspect of your childhood and, of course, even in the womb and the environment, (laughs) it's just, yeah, you writing horror was an inevitability. (laughs) It wasn't wasn't Mm -hmm. even a decision, like everything aligned. Uh, Yeah, when I started writing horror, I'm sure I mined a whole lot of, you know, childhood fears and experiences like that. Because uh, it just even now when I'm writing these little short stories for these little collections, it's like, you know, you know I, I think back to my childhood and, and uh, you know, fears and, and being scared of certain things and everything come back to me. So, yeah, I, I'd say I draw from that well quite a quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. And of course, at the beginning of the conversation, we spoke quite a lot about Grandmama Spicer and her storytelling and, you know, how that really ignited the imagination. But 
What I wondered is when you became a teenager and you then had aspirations to become a writer, how did the way that you received her storytelling change and what things do you think listening to her stories taught you about telling stories for yourself? Um, well, it's just, uh, you know, most writers, when they, they start writing, they want to be very eloquent and, and use a lot of big words. I never did that. I always wanted to write like I'm writing for the common man, you know, the, uh, something that the farmer or the, the blue collar worker or the, the mechanic down at the garage could sit down and enjoy it and not have to worry about getting Webster's dictionary out and trying to figure out what, you know, it's like, you know, when I was a teenager, I'd read Lovecraft and, and Poe and, and it was hard to digest, you know, <laughs> very, uh, you know, the, some of the, a lot of the language was hard to digest and, and, you know, I, I loved reading it, but it was, it wasn't easy going a lot of times. And, so I told myself when I when I started writing that you know I I wanted to you know write a certain way where you know anybody could enjoy it you know and not not have to be a, a college English professor to to get what I was trying to convey. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And well, I think your your writing is clear proof that it has been achieved and if i think about you know kind of straight shooting yarns from southern horror writers i mean you and joe r lansdale are the two that immediately mm -hmm. come to mind well, that's nice <laughs> it's good company to be in oh oh yeah yeah well what advice would you give to your 18 year old self uh, not be impatient, <laughs> be ready to, to, you know, stick in there for the long haul. Uh, don't think you're going to get rich. Right. Mm. You, know? <laughs> you know, I remember I would, I would sit in class and I'd draw diagrams of the mansion that I'd have in a, two or three years, you know, and you know, that, that never came to pass, but, uh, it maybe never will, but, um, you know, you know, if you're, if you're going to be a writer, you've, I mean, there, you know, so many movies and TV shows make writers out to be, you know, well, you're, you're not truly a writer unless you're wildly successful and you're rich and everything. I said, you know, I mentioned the Hallmark movies, well, that's, that's a big common theme on them. Every writer I've ever seen on one of those movies, you know, had bestsellers and 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 stuff like that and it's just you know that's not the way writing is you know you've got to uh, you you got to try to have patience you got to have a thick skin don't don't beat yourself up when when uh, you get a rejection i mean everybody gets rejections i i got you know i submitted to the horror show uh, david silva's horror show back in uh, the late eighties, you know, mm. just love, just love that magazine. Wanted to get into it, submitted 75 or 80 stories, never did get one accepted. So, uh, but I didn't, I didn't stop. You know, I just kept right going, you know, kept going. And, uh, and that's what you have to do. You just got to dig in. And, and if you want it bad enough, you, you can get it. If you, if you stick it out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's there. Uh fantastic lesson for anyone and anything you know just that perseverance and sticking it out mm -hmm. well what should you be kinder to yourself about uh not be so critical uh, i'm more critical of my artwork when i do artwork i'm more critical of that than i am of my writing right now i've gotten to the point in my writing where i'm very comfortable with it and i'm uh you know, it's, it, I'm not, you know, agonizing over stuff like I used to. Um, I'd say maybe I need to just uh, kind of relax and not um, 
um, not agonize so much about, you know, uh, what I'm going to, if, if what I write next is going to be popular or anything like that, I, you know, all writers want that, you know, if you have a, a, a good selling book, then you want the next one to do just as well. Well, you know, you can't always have, uh, I can't always have a fear, you know, it's, uh, that comes very, uh, you know, very rarely. So I'm not right now. I'm not worrying about, you know, uh, it's like Joe Lansdale says, you're, you're the first reader. If, you know, don't worry about, you know, what everybody else wants you to write, you write it. And if you enjoy it, then, you know, others will probably enjoy it too. Yeah. Yeah. That's smart. Well, where can our listeners connect with you? You can find me, uh, my website, ronaldkelly.com. You can get on there and uh, I'm on Facebook as Ronald Kelly. Um, I'm on uh, Twitter as uh, Ronald Kelly 4. I don't know why I'm number four, <laughs> uh, but that's what they, they gave me. But uh, And I'm on uh, Instagram as Dixie Darkin. And uh, you can go. You can subscribe to my Substack uh, newsletter. I just put out uh, the Fair County Chronicle, and I get all the news of um, uh, you know books that this uh, works in progress and books that's going to be released. and And sometimes I put in you know, uh, a classic story or a new story, and and uh, I, I did a photo spread and a, a story on the scares that cares that I just went to. So, so, so go, you know, subscribe to my, uh, newsletter. You can always go on Facebook or Twitter and, and find, you know, where I have a, something where you can subscri- subscribe. So yeah, was, there's several places to, to search me out. And, and when I get the, the online bookstore, you know, you can get on there and order some books or, or you can, you know, just get in touch with me, you know, uh, privately, and 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 I'll be glad to get some books to you. You know. All right. Well, thank you for being so generous with your time this evening and chatting with us. I, I appreciate. It. I appreciate y'all having me on there. Like I, like I said, uh, I've been listening to y'all for a long time, and it was just a real honor to come on here and talk to you. Well, the pleasure is all ours. And listeners must go and pick up a copy of Southern Fried and Horrified. You're going to get loads more stories like this conversation in terms of Ronald's life. And you're going to get a load of writing advice as well. Things on editing, things on suspension of disbelief dialogue, rejection, character description. There's a hell of a lot of good stuff in there. So I do implore people to pick it up. And as we said before, I mean, also that cover, I mean, God damn, if you're going to (laughs) have a memoir, (laughs) you might as well have that. I mean, just, you know, if, if you have, if you're listening and you haven't seen it, then, then just Google it, have a look at that cover. Obviously, if you're driving, wait until you stop driving. (laughs) But do Google it at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, phenomenal. I I, I think that cover is going to be on my phone until they shovel dirt over my face. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Because I can't see anything other than, you know, having that as my my wallpaper on my phone. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Amazing. Well... Do you have any final thoughts to leave our listeners with? Uh, just I, I appreciate everybody, uh, everybody uh, checking out my work and and uh, uh, support me all these years. Um, I, recently, a, a lot of people who read me back in the eighties and nineties have got in touch with me, and and that's been that's meant a lot to me. And and new fans, I mean. It, just in the the last year, um, I've, I've met, met so many new people over social media and at conventions, and and I, I'm just very grateful, uh, grateful, and and feel blessed that 
that I had the opportunity to to write in this genre and and you know continue to write. You know, uh, you know, you know, I'm getting on in years, but I'm I'm my you know. Uh, my imagination's still going full force, and and I've got many more books to to offer. So uh, thanks to everybody for you know for uh, their support and and uh, loving my books. You know. Thank you so much for listening to this is horror with Ronald Kelly. Join us again next time for the first part of the conversation with Gemma Amore celebrating the release of her new book, Full Immersion. Now, if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want every episode ahead of the crowd, if you want to support me, because I am going through a hell of a time right now. Wish I could get into it, but I can't. Then become a patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror you get early bird access to each and every episode you get to submit questions to each and every guest you get the patrons only q a sessions you get story unboxed the horror podcast on the craft of writing the video cast on camera off record and you can become a member of the writers forum on discord lots of great reasons to become a patron Check it out, patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. Their watching is the wicker man meets body double with a splash of Suspiria. They're Watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. Well, that about does it for another episode of This Is Horror. But after our conversation with Jason Pardian, which you'll hear shortly, particularly if you're a patron, patreon.com forward slash thisishorror, join us today. We have decided to join TikTok. I don't really know what I'm doing over there yet, but I've taken the opportunity to share some pretty cool sound bites, some clips from the podcast. So if you'd like a little bit of goodness, a little bit of an audio treat for your ear, 30, 60 seconds or so, then follow us on TikTok. Can't believe I'm saying that, but this is what's happening in 2022. We are simply this is horror podcast on tiktok of course you can also follow us on twitter and on instagram so whatever your social media poison and it can be poison it's a force for good or a force for bad then this is horror is there and with that said i will see you in the next episode with Gemma more but until then take care of yourselves be good to one another read horror Keep on writing and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.